My name is Mary Foley and I'm a Portland History docent here at Evergreen. I'm also a member of um, Evergreen Cemetery, um, Friends of Evergreen Cemetery, which is an organization to help preserve and protect the cemetery. Um, the membership is $25 a year. It's nonprofit. Um, we just recently had a restoration um, project out here. Uh, we hired an expert from Massachusetts to try to teach us how to restore some of the markers, um, how to clean them. Most of all what we do is we give tours and our tours are theme based. They're historical events that have happened in Portland. Our historical people are like today the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association. We're going to, I think I have about 20 um, past members that I will highlight and we'll discuss the organization. But a few words about Evergreen Cemetery. Evergreen Cemetery was purchased by the city of Portland in 1852. It was then part of Westbrook. It was um, Stevens Plains. The whole area was flat. They felt this is a great area for a cemetery. 55 acres were initially purchased and then um, as the years went by they've uh, Right now, I think it is 269 acres are owned. This is um, the cemetery, you know, we're kind of flat, but then you slope down and there's ponds in the back and then the uh, trails from the city of Portland also have hitched on there. Um, it was created as a, what I think of as a Victorian garden cemetery. Being, that was sort of in the mid 1850s, the new trend. Um, for cemeteries versus cemeteries that were in churchyards or the western and eastern cemeteries. As the cities became more populated, um, people were a little leery about having so many, um, I guess, graves or whatever. They felt that this could cause disease or vapors from the, the whatever. So they tended to want more rural areas for the cemetery. So this is, I believe, the second rural um, Victorian Garden Cemetery in Maine, the other being in Bangor. Um, that being said, unless anyone has any questions, but as we go along I'll discuss more about the cemetery. Anything I've forgotten I'll certainly mention. The next thing, this tour is about the Maine Charitable Mechanics Association. And I'm a native of Portland. I grew up in Portland. I think I walked past that hall all my life, never even knew it was there. And, and this, as Pat, who is the present-day librarian there, she can um, vouch for that. She says, everyone who comes in there says, well, where has this place been, you know? And to me, a place that Portland's wrecking ball hasn't gotten yet is just such an important historic piece of this city. The Maine Mechanics um, Association was started in 1815 without the building that wasn't there yet. They used to meet at City Hall or different places throughout the city. And um, they were, it was started, the, the founding fathers were tradesmen themselves, one being a baker, one being a shoemaker. So they were tradesmen who kind of wanted to come together to, to better themselves. If the, the way I think of it, it's sort of the precursor to vocational education the industrial art. These were all tradesmen, um, mechanics, shipbuilders, printers, etc. And as we go along, I will discuss that more. So they, um, in 1820, an important piece was started was a library. And of course, this was to, to, to better them educationally. And because at that time, uh, you know, a lot of uh, tradesmen couldn't read or write and so part of their apprenticing which was really brought through the, the mechanical association was to teach them to read and write so it's always been an institute of learning especially for tradespeople. Um, eventually they purchased uh, land on the corner of Corner and Casco and built what today st still stands as Mechanics Hall. And I have uh, just a little, this is sort of uh, before, this is a picture I think from 1870s. And Carter's Jewel, Jewelers, if you're from Portland, 
this building was right across the street from porches and oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. When you say when I say that, people go, "Oh yeah, that building." And this is oops, sorry. This is sort of what it, it what it looks like today, present day. Not much change, not much change. But one thing that I really like to show is this. I love the arm of labor, which is right above, you know, and in these pictures you can't really no, you can't see it, but I just think this is just fabulous. And another picture I have here is just to kind of give you an idea exactly how old that building is because that's Congress Street and that's the building right when it had gone up and I mean you can see they weren't you know they're just little kind of stores there. So all that being said I think that we should start and like I say I will get into more about the mechanics and what they do as we go along. So this is Edward Souther Griffin. Edward became a member in 1859 under the trade of a carver. Now he was what they called a, um, he carved the, the heads on the wooden ships before they would sail. It was said that no where the ship would ever leave Portland without, you know, a, a carved head. This was before iron, so he was, uh, he started out with his um, father down on, I think it was India Street, his father had a uh, shop. His father carved uh, piano casings, real, I, I, and you have to remember, this is the Victorian era where everything was extremely ornate. And um, at 17, he kind of left that and kind of went, opened up his own business of the ship. And he worked for a shipbuilder named Jacob Winslow, who if you look through those trees, you'll see that tall monument. And we will look at that further. I have further uh, specifications about that. He carved in pine. So unfortunately, all his work, which articles I've read, it was just magnificent. His carving was stupendous. Um, went down with the ships, <laughs> you know, because it was pine. There's one item that we know of that's left, and it's at the um, Portland Fire Station Museum, and it's eagles. It's an eagle head, like a carving of an eagle. So if you're ever in there, you can say, oh, I know that. Um, he then got into sculpting, I guess, in granite. <laughs> so the thing that I've I do feel that you will all, when I show you this, kind of, he is the sculptor of the fireman. Yeah, and I mean, that's pretty, pretty great. Then, also, he sculpted Mr. Winslow over there, which, like I say, we will go to see, and I have some stuff on him. So, I think he's a pretty noteworthy member of the main charitable mechanics. Um, Mary, yeah. Um, wasn't that fireman monument in the Yes, in that, exactly, yes, you're right. This, it was initially at the Western Promenade, and I think in about 1910 they brought it out here, and I would say this is a picture of it when it was here, because it certainly isn't where it is now, up on Congress Street in front of the, uh, okay. so it left here in 1987 and went up to Congress Street, so, yeah. I had that on my notes, but yeah. Walter Griffin, artist. Artist. That, that his yeah, son? that, yes, that was his son. Yes. And his father, I believe, is buried here too. Yeah, this guy was uh, an impressionist artist, but he wasn't a member, so I couldn't concentrate. <laughs> I had, I've got a lot, there's a lot, a lot, I can't tell you how many people buried here belong to the main charitable mechanics. It, it's just amazing, you know. And, and I kind of like think of this place as an outdoor museum. I mean, there is so much. When we get into the end of the tour and we get into some of the big, oh, it's, it's just beautiful. And, and you can see like the, the grass paths, there's grass, gravel, you know, and if you look at those, you'll see how they, they start wrapping around. And that was the whole, um, this Charles Howe, who was a civil engineer, the, the, he was the architect of this cemetery, and I guess they, they 
had put it up as a, a, a contest, and he won the contest for. But he wanted it to be, you know, there, there at one time were fountains and gardens, and like the pond had a bridge that went across. It was just, I mean, it still is beautiful. But, and I read an article in 1862. The superintendent out here in the month of August kept track of how many people came here, over 5,000 people. Because from Portland, they could take the trolley out here. And a lot came in horse and carriage, but a lot could take the trolley because the trolley went up to the Riverton Casino, which is why the CMP built the trolley, so that, so that they could get transport people back and forth to the casino. So it, wa it was a convenient route. This is our next stop. This man is J.T. Emery. And he, he's sort of one of our favorites out here because he was a member in 1855 and his train was Stonecutter. Now he is responsible for a lot of the family plot hedging, the curbing. He also, I should have mentioned before, but when we were first coming down western to the left used to be the city tombs and he built those um, because it, in that in those days when uh, if you had died in the winter or whatever they'd have to store the body so that's where and it was new um, I think he built it probably like in the 18 mid 1860s or whatever it went in out here because the western prom and the eastern proms were getting so old that that, that they needed to replace stuff like. So that being said, this man did, um, he was a past president of the Maine Charitable Mechanical Association, is uh, he did this, which I think is, you know, the edging is, is just beautiful. But the unfortunate thing about this cemetery is that nothing is signed. So you never really know who did what. And, you know, some of the stuff out here is so gorgeous. You, I just feel that that's important, that he did some important stuff out here. And they'll always say, oh, Joshua Emery, you know, did this or whatever. But to me, I, I like to have documentation of exactly. I don't have clear documentation that he even did this, but, you know, I think we could assume. However, <laughs> I have found two sites, three sites that I know that he did. So as we go along, I just kind of want us to sort of all remember this man. And um, I will point out some of his artwork as I, because I call it artwork. I mean, I think this, some of, of what is out here is just beautiful. But as we go along, I, I, I have definite sources that tell me what he did. This is Edward H. Elwell. He became a member in 1855 as a printer. He also was the editor of the Portland Transcript and founder of the Maine Press Association. So he, he was big into newspaper. He was editor of a newspaper. And we'll see another editor, well, owner, proprietor, also on this. Um, he also wrote history books about Portland, um, one of them being Portland and Vicinity, Boys of 35, the story about his childhood in Portland. And he is, uh, he gave free lectures at, Mechanics Hall, which a lot of the prominent citizens did do during that time, or educated be, because, again, like I had said, it was an establishment for the betterment of tradespeople. Um, he said about the Charitable Mechanics Association, which I think is a really nice quote, an organization formed for charitable and educational purposes offers free evening school for instruction in industrial training and gives free lectures by resident citizens. And, and that's sort of what it was all about. And, and if you think, back then there was no welfare, there was no uh, pensions, there was no um, life insurance. So if one of the members' family passed away, uh, if, if a member passed away, his family was sometimes just basically left destitute. And this is where the charitable mechanics would step in and they would uh, help the family. So, it, like I say, it, it, sometimes I think of it too as kind of a precursor to, to unions, I would say, or just in people being treated better as employees treating employees better. It was sort of a, 
kind of a, like a wake-up call, like, you know, these people work hard and, and we should try to do more. But at least these tradespeople, these members had this association that would help them out. And I think it was a neat thing. And this is just a little um, advertisement that was in the paper, how they would uh, advertise um, about the hall. The Edward Elwell uh, will, was will be speaking on the poetry and humor of dialect. And it was the tradesmen of that time for a wider um, civilization, more knowledge they, they were seeking. And it was a great, great thing for them. Now, over there, you'll see that gate. That's H.H. H. Booty, who was a past member, too. And he's the one. And, and we'll see it. Uh, I'll show it to you. It's, uh, you can see it right there, but when we go there, we're going to take a turn here and you get, get a better view about, of that. He was a former member and he's the one who left the money for the, for the trust. There's a, right. still to this day, is right. the Booty Trust the booty at fund. the Booty Fund, yeah. Oh. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the, this is a, um, Mr. M.G. Woodman, who was not a member. But I found an article where he sued J.T. Emery for the work he did here. So, because, so, I, so I was really happy to find that because then I'm like, well, now I know for sure something that he did. It's documented. So you can see he used what they call the block letters. And what um, the, the man was so upset about was he wanted to have the edging to go around for you know, all the way around. But Emery said, well, you've got stones, but you know, you can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. So anyway, they went to court and, uh, but that's irrelevant irre to me. I was just happy to, to know exactly what he, you know, his work out here. Um, and that, like I, right there, that's H.H. Booty with that iron. And then when you see that iron trellis, remember we had spoken mm -hmm. about the older part of the right. cemetery. That would be the entrance to the older part. And this is William Willis. He was not a member, but I know for sure from do I have the documentation that J. T. Emery did this work plus did the monument. So I think that's quite, quite lovely. Uh, the, the, that work, I, I think it was very, very nice. And then, so like now that I've seen that, now when I go through, this, I see. I'm starting to see others that look like that and think, oh, it must have been J.T. Emery who did that. So, so the, this next man is Charles P. Kimball. He was a member and past president. He came in and he was past president from 1857 to 1868. And he came in as a carriage maker. Oh, well, you know, we don't think think much of, you know, the horse and buggy age anymore and the sleighs and stuff like that. So this was a, uh, he was, he lived up in Norway. He was one of ten children. There were six boys in the family and they were all, the, the father had been into this business. It had been like 300 years in the family. They were blacksmiths, sleigh makers, blah, blah, blah. So he came to Portland and opened up a little retail shop. This is like on the corner of Congress and Preble, I think. Again, mid-1850s before Congress is met. So I'm reading this, like so much, this man. So then he goes on to open up um, businesses in Chicago and New York, factories of making these carriages. He was an extremely wealthy man. And his brothers also followed in his footsteps. And you, if you were to Google him, there's so much information about his carriages. He even went, he had one called the Portland, uh, Strutter, which was, it looked to me like a singular carriage, like one, two people would be in. And he went to Paris, to the Expo, in, exposition in Paris with it. But these were like s some of the ideas of what he did. And he just um, fascinates me when, you know, we don't think back on, on that era that often. And uh, there, there was just, in these men, and oh, and women, his wife, Mrs. Kimball, according to the, the book I read there from, from the organization, she taught um, drawing at the uh, 
main charitable. I always try to bring in anything female. I mean, females are allowed now, but you know, back then. But it, they, and, and the association also used to let the suffragists come in and have their meetings there. So I'm very, I'm all over that. I think that's a great thing. So, you know, you have to, it was an all male organization, but that was the time. But I think that they were, were not anti-woman by anything. And this is just a picture of um, him and his brothers. And, I, and we'll see his other brother over uh, on the other side, who has a beautiful monument. You can see how the middle class is emerging. I mean, you look at 1820, it's all the capitalist and, well, not really. After the 1812 embargo or something, these, a lot of these capitalists lost their money or whatever. So it, in 18, it's kind of the emergence of the middle class. And you can see the, you know, how much the association helped make the middle class. And, and this was the main mechanic. There were other mechanical, charitable mechanic associations in other states, uh, Massachusetts, New York, etc. So it wasn't, this just isn't a singular just in this state. So they were helping throughout the country to, to build the middle class. I, I think it's great. This is Newell Foster, Newell A. Foster. He was uh, past president from 1860 to 1861. Newell went in, um, in 1853 became a member. His trade was a printer. He was the owner, proprietor of the Daily Press, which he started in 1862. He was uh, born in New Hampshire in 1815. He, um, his brother was the Stephen Foster, which you probably don't, but he, Stephen Foster was a big time abolitionist. And this Newell Foster, he was rather, um, to me, he was sort of like a liberal-minded, reforming kind of man. Um, when, you, when we talk about the newspapers back then, you have to remember there was no phones, no TV, no, you know, the newspapers were it. So you had your real conservative newspapers and you had your liberal newspapers. And um, Elwell tended to be a little bit more conservative, in my opinion, than this man did. Um, this guy also, what he did for the association, he was in the state legislature, I think between 1860 and 67, and he was able to procure $11,000 from the state to help pay off the bonds and loans for the building, um, the, the Mechanics Hall, which cost $40,000 when they did it. Um, and they had to borrow money and they had bonds. Well, he was able to get $11,000 from the state because they were talking about, um, you know, agricultural education or more education for trade. He's like, look, we got the place, you know, let's just uh, show me the money and we'll make it statewide. You can all come down. <laughs> so he did. So that's, I mean, he was responsible for paying off a quarter of that debt, which I think is pretty big. But the real reason why I'm partial to this man <laughs> is, well, unfortunately, he passed away in Boston while attending an anti-suffragist, I mean a suffragist anti, suffragist meeting with his wife and daughter. So he, he was, I mean, that's 1868. He's extremely liberal-minded because that, that's when the suffragists, it was post-Civil War and they were just getting going again. So he was with his wife and daughter. He was actually nominated as a vice president of this new chapter and he accepted it. and. But unfortunately, he died and was brought back to Maine to be buried. It was quite sad, but I... Um, I guess that might serve as a warning to any men who... <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't like to say that, but I know, and I know, I know that Elwell was an anti-suffragist, and that's, you know, what I'm saying. He, you know, I think there were some, not that I'm saying suffragists, anti-suffragists is what makes you conservative and non-conservative, but I knew, do know from reading that, that Elwell's paper was more conservative than this man's. He, he was a more liberal minded kind of reformer type. This is the Jacob Winslow statue that Edward Suther Griffin, the first man that we saw in the tour, sculpted. This man was a, a shipping um, shipbuilder in Portland. 
as I had said before, where Griffin did his things. But what I really wanted to talk about, this is um, 18 feet high, um, framed of eight pieces of granite. The weight of the car, it's 22 tons. I'm like, wow, 22 tons. Um, the, the flag with the W on it, which is on one of the sides there, um, is um, the flag of, of the firm that he was the head of. And Winslow himself is seven and a half feet tall. The figure is cut from a piece of granite weighing six tons in the rough. And his left arm holds a spyglass. And I believe it's made, let's see, Trenton, made almost entirely from Hollowell granite, which I assume was Hollowell, Maine. So, so this is William Capon. Now, a lot of the members of the association already know this. I'll take that um, book. But in 1841, the association held the first fair, the first exposition, um, held in Maine, actually. And they held it in Portland, Congress Street, Chandler's Band was there. Uh, it was a, a big thing. I think over 24,000 people had come to this. Um, and it was an exhibit to show their work. And what they would do is they would present um, gold, bronze, gold, silver, and bronze medals to the, to the um, best projects submitted, etc. But what William Capon did was um, he, they had a flag for each um, trade, for each trade group. This happens to be one of my favorites. This is, would be the, uh, obviously, the shoemakers. He that will not pay the shoemaker is not worthy of a soul. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of really like that. And what they would do, these banners were about mm, 35 by 40, I think Pat and I figured out. And I did read that they would uh, present them either with a wooden arm board or whatever, and they'd march down Congress Street, and all the trades would march together. And, uh, well, they were, the, the amazing about this is that the Mechanics Association has kept these for over 150 years, the library, I, wherever they put them. But obviously that's not a controlled climate, like in a museum or whatever. So, so they did um, sell them in 2010, and I think there's over like $100,000, which was good for the association and, and good to preserve these because they are really, really, you know. And, and when we go to the um, chapel afterwards, I'll just kind of leave this book on a table if people want to just take a look at them. Fifteen of them were made by this man who started out as a chairmaker, by the way. <laughs> and uh, then he just, um, he became a member in 1826, so it was even before the, the, the building. Um, and he was a chairmaker and then became the painter of signs. Uh, and by 1830s, he was best known for his sign meeting. So it was kind of like, you know, you have to think, you know, in the, the, that he's meeting with people and they're saying, well, you know, you paint good, why don't you start painting or something like that. So it was a progression. Um, and, and the reason for the banners was, I guess, during the Revolutionary War, the main militias always had, each militia had their own banner. So in 1840s, that was still kind of fresh in everyone's mind, where the militias all marched under the same banner. So I think they got it in the heads for their trades to march under the, the same. And the, the banners were oil on linen, approximate size 38 by 35 inches, about the size of the map. Um, and from this man's obituary, <laughs> it's kind of sad, but um, for many years Mr. Capon has been deprived of the use of his legs by the disease known as painter's colic. <laughs> so sad, you know. Nowadays you wouldn't really see that. That would be disability, I think, but uh, yeah, so he was a hard working man and he did a lot. He played, wore a lot of hats. Also, he was like, I think, secretary for a number of years there, but he was very, very much involved with the uh, the mechanics, and uh, it just amazes me how these flags have, I mean, it's like 170 years, mm -hmm. they're, they're old in there, and, and when I read that, when they went up, they were going to go up for auction, but all the museums in Maine, and even the Smithsonian kind of said, no, we need to keep these together, and um, so th th I guess they 
I'm not sure they let the Maine Historical Society bid or whatever, but anyway, they got them. And so now they really are in a safe place in a controlled environment so that, you know, no damage. But, I mean, you have I've never seen them. I mean, you and I probably saw them. Are, are they in good condition? Well, they're all you? restored now. They are. They're oh, they had to be. I Hopefully there'll be a presentation in 2015. Oh, is I was wondering. Yeah. We saw a way in with some sort of celebration with them. And they're hoping maybe they reproduce them actually because they don't really want to show them too much. So really? they're, they're in a, huh. yeah, I don't know how that's going. So well, that's not really so. <laughs> but all the all the pictures like are available on main memory <laughs> on main memory. Now yeah, that's where I got all, all these. But I like pictures. to see the they real got thing. pictures of them. <laughs> so this next man is Joseph R. Thompson. And he was a member in 1833. His trade, he was a stone cutter. He was president of the uh, mechanics from 1845 to 1846. In 1850, his business was located at the corner of Federal and Pearl, and he lived at 121 Oxford Street. He, um, this is, I kind of like this picture, that his father was Enoch M. Thompson, who was also in the same business. And if you look closely, it's kind of hard to see, I know, from a distance, but that would be his father's um, shop where he, where he made the monuments. And this was um, down at, on Preble Street in Portland. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> this, I had told you about medals and stuff. This Mr. Thompson um, got the Civil Medal for marble work oh. of superior <laughs> quality. Um, I think he did a mantle, and I'm not really sure. His, uh, yeah, his bi business was located uh, Federal and Pearl. And um, Bob can speak more to the, the actual mm -hmm. architecture or whatever, the, the cutting of that stone. I, he does a much better job than, it, than I would do. Oh, that's not true. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> but Plus, I want to break. I'm very interested in these marble <laughs> columns throughout the cemetery. Okay. And Art knows a lot about this, too, is that the, the, the Thompson shop made some of the most exquisite Renaissance Revival marble columns as the, as the, you know, the family stone in the middle of the, of the extended lots. And this is sort of remarkable in that it's both, it's both relief Thank meaning the, the text was, was, was cut out of the stone rather than inscribed the into the stone. And so you can read the generations of family by sort of the, 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 the technique of, 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 of writing the letters, of writing the memorial around the stone. But what is so nice about them it, to me is that they, they, they're, they're Renaissance revival, they're not Gothic. The cemetery is full of Gothic monuments and, of course, full of, you know, the Egyptian obelisk because those date from the opening of the Suez Canal where the engineers and the architects of England and America saw for the first time the, the ornamentation and the sculpture of Egypt. And because they were cutting a canal through it, they thought Egypt was a dead society, so these were great symbols of death. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Funny thing about colonial thinking. Um, but this is so lovely in that it's it's kind of medieval and it's sort of renaissance that it has that great cap at the top and the caps on the monument actually serve to protect the letters because it stops the stops the the rain and the weather from eroding the the actual inscriptions one of the worst things to happen here is if a, if a stone slants backwards and and its writing faces the faces the elements constantly being being worn down by the weather and the wind and the rain and the snow and the ice. But those caps actually have a function to preserve the memory of the people that are buried there. And it's full of it's full of, of, of granite cutting in relief. And then this, the, 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 the monument itself, the, the marble monument, sits on a granite base. And we've just learned of course that all these monuments are upright and and perfect after being here for 150 years because that chunk of granite sits on another chunk of granite which then sits on another foundation that was made for it that goes down to the frost line which is 50 inches in Maine. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that it's so that the so that they're preserved, they're upright, they're they're mm -hmm. architectural. It's 
really kind of phenomenal. And this was a double, this was a double stacked um, curb here. You see the first stack is kind of falling, falling away a little bit. That's what happens when a foundation, at the frost line is not made for it. And we've all shoveled the stuff. We know that snow is really heavy. So when there's a snow <coughs> mass in it and a, and a melt at the same time, the stones keep sinking. And just so you'll know, granite is 200 pounds a square foot. Wow. So it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy, heavy, heavy material. This is um, Stephen Berry. Now, he, he was a, a member in 1853, came in as a printer. I won't say a lot, but the one thing I want, he was also a mason. If you look at, that's the sign of the masons, and you see them everywhere in the cemetery. But his is rather interesting because it has kind of like quills on it because he was a, secreta a secretary with the masons. So just a little bit, but you'll see that sign all over the, um, on a lot of the stones out here, and that, that means that they were uh, a, a mason. This is Walter Corey. Now, he was a member in 1841. He came in as a chairmaker. He um, was a, a pretty um, big uh, furniture maker in Portland, made extremely nice furniture. Um, he started on Exchange Street, but during the big fire of 1866, he got burnt out, moved to Free Street. Um, Thomas P. Beals apprenticed with him, who we'll, go, we'll visit uh, later. But a lot of his work can be seen in the Schofield Whittier House in Brunswick. It's, um, oh, it's on their historic site. Um, they, they do tours, but it's, I guess it's pretty much the same as it was in the day, something like the Victoria Mansion, and a lot of his furniture is in there. So, and, and this is just an example of a chair that he made. But I've seen other stuff that was certainly more ornate, but I mean, it was just made so nicely. This was a table that was recently on eBay. If you go on eBay, you see a lot of, the, uh, of his stuff if you, you know, have the money, and that was his uh, trademark. But I'll have this book in the chapel if anybody really wants to, to take a look. <laughs> this man was, um, he was a member in 1826, and he was a hatter in Portland. He made hats. And um, one of the funny things, when uh, you look at the banners, the ones for the hatters, there's a beaver on there. And I'm like, why is there a beaver on that? Beaver hat. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah. Um, he, in the... What Lynn told me is that he grew up in Jamaica Plains in Massachusetts, and I guess this pudding stone is the only place where that comes from. I haven't read this myself. This was told to me. And so they imported it, I guess, from that's what he wanted for his, his mark. He had a hat store on Middle Street, and he, and he was a very philanthropic character. He belonged to the Benevolent Society, um, widows helped widows. Um, one interesting thing I read, in 1829 there were people in Elwell who were protesting against him and others for killing animals for the fur, so I thought that was rather pertinent. That was 1829. <laughs> we still do, you know, it's come a long way since then. But. This next one, this man was not a, 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 a mechanic, but I know for a fact that this is J.T. Emery's work. Um, is the most striking of any. In the, the coping is an oblong square of handsome granite with rounded bastion-like corners. Below the step is um, tessellated tiles. And then they, in, unfortunately, I mean this without those trees probably look just absolutely gorgeous, but the trees have uprooted what they call the tessellated tiles. But if you look at the work, the, the, the edging and stuff, it's a much more sophisticated than the first stuff that we had seen by Emery. So I, I think that it, it's beautiful. And I don't know if this, I just, I had found this article the other night and yesterday I, we were walking through and I just checked and I went, oh wow, that is this guy. So I don't know, he probably was somehow related to J.T. Emery, but I know that this is his work and I, it's just, I'm sure it, it's just too bad that this has been so uprooted, but the, the edging and stuff has, has stayed nice in the kind of like, I don't know how to describe 
the architect stuff that well, but it just looks much, much more involved than, than the first work that we saw on the other side. So I was glad to find it. So this is one of the four weeping women in the cemetery. And this man was J. M. Kimball. He was the brother of Charles P. Kimball, also a carriage maker and was a member in 1854. But it's too bad that son, this is just a beautiful, beautiful monument. Um, he also was quite the uh, carriage maker, too, winning medals at the, the fair. And uh, it said that he must have made a good amount of money in his life because he summered, he wintered in Florida and summered in Maine. So. But I think that is just striking. I, I love the angels out here. Neil Dow, who is right over here. And Neil Dow did everything in Portland. <laughs> I'm sure you, he was an ex-mayor. He was the father of Prohibition. Um, he was a Civil War veteran, was um, captured, imprisoned in Anderson, was traded out, brought back. He was uh, in the rum riots um, because he was the father of Prohibition. And he, in 18, he, he came in in 1826, and when he came in to the association, he also brought in temperance. There was no drinking, uh, which is a good thing. But and his son, Fred, was also um, a member of the mechanics. I don't have the year he came in, but he was also a Civil War veteran. Um, they came in under the trade of Tanner, and I believe it was down somewhere. They were all down in the Old Port area is where the, where the jail is, is where, and it was Neil Dow's father who started that tannery, and then they sort of all went through, but he, um, actually, I have a picture, picture of him and Fred. It's Neil, and that's his son, Fred. Can't see it. Hold it on. It's a little it's, Oh, I'm sorry. I know, it's hard to... It's not like you've got a computer with a PowerPoint presentation going on out here, so it's a little difficult. And I, and I really like this, you know, because everyone says, oh, father of prohibition, blah, blah, blah. But I think this is a really, the home versus the saloon. I mean, it was so awful in Portland, the drinking. I mean, they rang bells at 11 o'clock and 4 o'clock for the men to stop work and go get a drink. And, I mean, Neil Dow was really responsible. <laughs> <laughs> Neil Dow was really um, quite responsible for obviously ending all of that. And uh, there's a lot to be said. I mean, women were, the men would get paid and go drink the whole pay, you know, and then women were being beaten, <coughs> children abused because of alcohol. So. You know, we kind of laugh at that old prohibition, blah, blah, blah. But there was a big side, an important, it was an important thing, I think, that he did for the city. And uh, I just thought that spoke volumes for him. And that was a common theme with all the early members, absolutely. Yeah. No. From 1915 on, that was a common theme. Right? No alcohol. Yeah. Well, and y you know, <laughs> look at how, I mean, we're really emerging. We're moving on up here in the middle class. I mean, if you see these stones, you know, these people were very, very well, you know, smart men and, and uh, made a lot of money for themselves and their families. And I have to believe that, you know, a lot of it was from the help of, of being in an association like that. It, it certainly, because the, the, uh, the hall used to let these men do business there too, because a lot of them didn't have offices or anything. So they could go and conduct their business, sign contracts, whatever, by using the, the mechanic hall. Now this next man, Augustus G. Schlauterbeck, I'm like, who was he? He was a chemist. He came in in 1868 as a chemist. I'm like, mm, you know, big deal. But then, <laughs> I don't know if it, I told you about the Masonic Temple in the article that was in the newspaper last week. So I went down there, and I'm up in this beautiful Corinthian room, and I'm like, oh, isn't this pretty, you know? And I look, and there's these beautiful stained glass windows up there, and in between is this big, big, huge, like, God, a portrait of this man. And I go up, and I go, 
Oh, there you are. <laughs> Augustus G. Schlotterbeck. I'd been looking everywhere for stuff. He paid for the Masonic Temple. He paid for it. I mean, this guy, he... So then I go, I delve more into him. Well, come to find out, down on Temple Street, um, there's a building called Schlotterbeck's. Well, lo and behold, built architect John Calvin Stevens. Yeah. There he was. He started out as a chemist. He had a drugstore at 501 Conga Street, kind of like this, open all night. I mean, this man was a worker. You know, he was going to get some, some, some money, and. Uh, but then, then he got into um, making instruments for physicians with another partner. He made a, a fortune in that, um, uh, improving stethoscopes, forceps, that type of thing. Then he got into um, flavorings, food, uh, making vanilla and that with a guy named Foss. And they still are in existence today. There's no stores in Maine, but if you go online, they're in Massachusetts. And... Um, it, that's his little logo sign, Schlotterbeck and Foss, and you can still buy the product. And he was a chemist. This man was also an abolitionist. He used to let the uh, the abolitionists use his printing stuff. He was a uh, he came in as a bookbinder in 1841. But he, I've read that he he would let them. Um, use his equipment for the abolitionist movement. Um, and I also read that, I guess his grandfather was part of the Boston Tea Party, so I thought that was a little interesting. And there's just a, a little, I didn't, couldn't find many pictures or anything on him, but just an advertisement for his, um, his shop, which was, um, I don't think they, number three, Preble Row. But I thought his the uh, the fact that he was a member. But the abolitionist thing really. There was a lot of abolitionists in Portland. It's amazing. And, um, he would let them use all his printing equipment. So he was a great person, I think. So this I find to be extremely unique. This is the area of E. T. Burroughs. He was a, came in as a member in 1898 as a manufacturer. Well, come to find out, this man patented screens that you use in your, you know, rust-proof screening. Um, he was born in Portland, the son of Irish immigrants. He patented the screens in 1878, made a fortune. Um, his company also made pool tables, cedar chest, crank photograph cabinets, and made a lot of tools. Now, the, the, um, the better photograph, he was located down on Spring Street, one through, one to 31 Spring Street, but it's not there anymore, it's gone. It's kind of like probably with a Holiday Inn and all of that down in that area. Now, and I've talked with people who remember it. I actually, my husband's aunt used to work there. I'd never heard of the place, but he, uh, then, you know, he'd advertise, he was all over the country with his screens, did an extreme, extremely good business. And I just, when I found his, uh, I don't know what you want to call this, a monument, or, I just think it's so unique and beautiful. It's just, it's great. Really, really nice. And I don't know, Bob might know some symbolism of it, I don't, but... Uh, it's just neat. I, I, it looks Grecian. Yes, Grecian is, is yeah. exactly. Yeah, but you know, the son of Irish immigrants. And, you know, he did very well for himself. Right here, um, this one back here with the urn is um, Captain Thomas Beale, Thomas P. Beals. He was the uh, apprentice with Walter Corey. He was a member in 1887. He was a furniture maker. But he also um, was a Civil War veteran who fought at Cold Harbor and, P and was wounded at Petersburg. He did very well for himself. Um, he started, oh, I, don't, I thought I could remember, down, uh, Kennebec Street is where he was. Um, and he also sold what they called adjustable spring beds. He'd sell about 5000 a year. So I think it was probably when the spring beds were just the spring 
like what we'd call a box spring now, but it was probably in the old mattresses that went on top. So he was, uh, but he was a he was a captain during the Civil War, and uh, fought in I think they said seven battles, two of them at Cold Harbor and Petersburg. So he and he was wounded at Petersburg. I don't know what the wounding was, but he he was uh, quite the man. Daniel Chandler, um, the Chandler's bands, and he was also a member of uh, the, the uh, mechanics. He came in as a musician. I don't know the year, but I just noticed that yesterday, and uh, Janet had gotten me a picture of him. But he was, uh, he would uh, play at all, like at that fair, and what they would say about him is, you know, before the bands, uh, the marching bands, whatever they do, the, the fifes there, like the revolutionary, you see them with the, and so it was kind of like a musical progression when these bands came along, and he was just famous, and uh, would play at functions all over Maine. And I, is it still in existence today, yes. Chandler's Band? Yes, yes. I, I thought so. Like I said, I just noticed him yesterday when I was walking. I went, oh, that's him. Yeah. So he he was quite the member himself. He was also uh, head of the Tenth uh, Regiment Band. And their be that was a very special band because it was all uh, drums, and they had about 20 drums, and they were very well known for uh, their drum band. This is uh, Luther Pingree, P Pingree, Pingree, Luther Pingree, and this is where I played drums. <laughs> Um, he was born in Norway, Maine, came to Portland in 80, 1844. In 1854, he was a member. He joined as a patent maker. Now, he um, was also past president of the mechanics. He invented the artificial leg. Now, he patented the artificial leg. Yeah, he, he patented, <laughs> yeah. He crapped it. Uh, but, you know, the Civil War soldiers actually are coming home, and they, I guess what you call them back then, the peg legs. Well, he just kind of looked, and he came up with his own uh, patent, his own leg, which had the sockets in it, so that they could have movement and stuff at the knee, which was quite a, quite a thing. Um, the South was Georgia, especially, was ordering from him. Um, he also, his inventing skills were used in making steam engines, carriages, mills for manufacturing lumber, and models for the patent office. He also served in the um, militia for the Aroostook Wars, Aroostook, which I don't really know much about, but um, that was part of his history. But I thought he was, that that's his patent right there, and you can see the, uh, I thought he was certainly worth, worth mentioning. I think he helped a lot of people with his, um, with his invention, his patent. So the next person is Frederick Thompson, and he became a member in 1889, and he came in as an architect, and he is the person who designed the chapel that we will be seeing after this tour, the Wild Chapel here in the cemetery. He also designed the, um, oh, this is a picture of him. I don't know if you can see it very well, but like I say, I'll have this book. But he designed also the Western, um, on the, the West House, on the Western Promenade. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful home. Um, and, yeah, that's, he did the, um, the West House. He did the Walker Memorial uh, Library in Westbrook. He, the former Children's Hospital at 66 High Street. Um, he's best known for his colonial revival, that is what he worked in. And he also designed the castle in Deering Oaks Park, the little castle mm -hmm. down there, yeah. And he designed the Portland Armory, which is now the Regency. So he was a, quite a prolific architect. And then I'm John Calvin Stevens. John Calvin Stevens. Um, he obviously left an indelible mark on Portland, designed more than 300 buildings in Portland and dozens more in surrounding areas and islands. He's the master of the shingle-style cottage that has come to symbolize the coastal line of New England. Um, he also ma mastered the Georginian-style colonial brick house. He lived at 52 Bowden Street for over um, 30 years. He um, I have a picture, actually. 
That's his home on Bowdoin Street. And they say if you want to see any work by John Calvin Stevens, just drive down Bowdoin Street because every house there practically is, was designed by him. That is the house that he lived in. This is that um, kind of revival that they're talking about. That's also up on 22 Bowdoin Street. And that's the last of the Stevens, his great, 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 or whatever, grandson. This was in one of the local papers. But um, I personally, I love that house. I know which house that is. It's just beautiful. And uh, I mean, you could go on and on about everything that he was responsible for. But I think the best way of expressing it is if you're interested, just take a ride Bowdoin Street. And practically every house on Bowdoin Street was designed by him. This is of not a member, but his son, who is also here, was a member who came in as, as an architect. But this, guy's, this guy was a printer. So when you look at the top here, and Bob, you can explain it better than me. Why don't you do that? Oh, the, his name is in relief on the top of the stone, only backwards, because when, when dies were set for printing, of course, you had to write all the, the, the words backwards, and so it's, um, it's, it's a reverse process. Um, and it's, it's, it is just kind of a monument to his great work as a printer. Yeah, yeah. it's really neat. It's, it's unique. And, I, and there's something on the back here is kind of a thing like, it's almost like if you lift it up, turned it over to stamp it, his name would be there. Right. So this is um, Francis, Francis H. Fassett. Um, he became a member in 1878 as an architect. This man um, is responsible for quite a few buildings in Maine. He, be, he was very prolific after the fire of 1866. One of the places, um, if you remember Hay and Peabody's on Congress Street, which is up for sale or was for like a million and something dollars, was, was one of his buildings. Um, he was an American architect in Maine who built as many as 400 homes and buildings throughout the state, worked in the Victorian High Gothic and Queenian styles. He especially influenced the look of Portland. And he's responsible for the Portland Public Library. Um, this was his house on Pine Street. And if you're familiar with Portland, it's up the West End Pine. You've probably seen it. He built that for him and his son. It's a duplex. It's beautiful. I, I know it. It's kind of across from Butler School in that area. Um, and of course, this place where I work, he, he was the main medical center, the, the old main general. He was the architect of that. And he was the architect for the base of Longfellow. And that concludes my tour. But like I say, the, um, remember that the chapel was Frederick Thompson, one of the architects that we saw here today, was the architect for this chapel. And the story behind that is the chapel is that um, it was uh, d dedicated to Samuel Wilde, whose wife, Mary Lunt Wilde, um, after he died, had it, it built in his honor. And to this day, it's still, and, and what was the year it was built? The 19, oh, the year the chapel was built, I can't remember off the top of my head. 1906, and it's still functioning today. Um, it was built for anyone who's buried here can have use of that chapel free. Um, and um, there, there have been uh, marriages, functions go on there. You can rent it from the, it, it, call the office.